Everybody, welcome to Retsu Talk, episode thirty-two. Um, Diabetes has recused himself from our special guest. Uh, so, some of you may know when we started Retsu Prey, this guy Proteus uh, used to do videos with us. And Proteus recently came up to me because in episode twenty-nine we talked about Total Biscuit, and he said he wanted to come on the podcast to uh, kind of talk about getting Total Biscuit kicked off the SA forums, in his words, and how much he didn't like him. So, fuck you, Proteus. Here's Total Biscuit. What's up? What's going on? I better remember the issue with Proteus, honestly. <laughs> Nor do you I remember funny. being kicked off the SA forums. I still have an account there. I just don't post. <laughs> All right. You know you know what? Uh, it's funny, though, is before we started recording this, I totally forgot to tell you about that setup. I'm so, really sorry. I can't imagine no, but... that that was deliberate or anything. It's fine. <laughs> I was preparing his joke because I do like to have a go at Proteus every now and again, but... um. Whatever. Fuck him. He hasn't been in a video since February. I owe him nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> how are you doing? Ah, uh, things are going all right. Kind of trundling along at the usual pace, really, right now. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for uh, recommending Brothers. I really fucking enjoyed that game. Yeah, I read your little piece on that, actually, which was pretty much exactly how I felt about it. But, you know, you had this nice lean towards the idea that it's one of those games that can't really work in any other medium that also means that you shouldn't watch it you should play it and you'll yeah. get that full experience out of it if you do and the more i've been thinking about it the more little things that i notice about that experience that really translate to the idea of telling a story and not just telling a story but expressing or making you feel different ideas it's really hard to explain the way the controls mm -hmm. work in that game, for instance, I initially complained about the idea that you have to keep holding down the buttons, right, when you're doing right. all of the shimmying along walls and things like that. But mm -hmm. the way I thought about it later on is that it's supposed to kind of convey the feeling of the characters and the fact that they're going kind of through this struggle and the fact that your fingers hurt or whatever, I suppose, is, uh, <laughs> is, is a way of transmitting that to the player, which really you don't it get in any other game. I think that's a really interesting idea. It's funny you phrase it like that, because what I was thinking was it's it's a very rare game where the controller uh, actually communicates something yes, to you, the yeah. player. You know, indirectly, and in scenes you're talking about, and even directly later, I feel, you know. Um, and that's why it's very hard to think of games to compare to Brothers. It's very you know? difficult. I, absolutely. Even Journey doesn't do that. You know? it's, Journey's a great game, don't get me wrong. A absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal title. But as a, as a game, it's kind of just standard in the way that the controls work aside from the non-verbal communication that they've got going on there. But Br right. Brothers is non-standard very much so in that respect. And it's not just a case of a gimmick, It's because it, it simply wouldn't work any other way, and it wouldn't convey the same kind of message. You know, it's funny you say that, too, because um, the one, one of the things I want to compare it to was almost like one of the, like a Kojima game, mm, insofar yeah. as how it tries to... But it, that seems a bit clunkier, where it just out and out breaks the fourth wall and knows it. Yeah. And I know that's sort of his thing. Whereas Brothers, it kind of it's more seamless. It's it kind of cat sneaks up on you in a way. You know what I mean? Especially towards the end. And I especially yeah, yeah. it's a moment that I wouldn't want to spoil for anybody. But I think it's actually a very powerful moment. And not in the way of it just it shows you something on the screen that hits you. It's beyond that. And if I yeah. if I said any more, I'd spoil it. But it, it's worth it's a worthy experience. Absolutely, yeah. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of great scenes in it that. And that brings me to another thing that I, I wrote up, uh, was I watched a Let's Play of Brothers, mm -hmm. and um, I was pretty unhappy with how the Let's Player treated the pivotal scenes in it, mm -hmm. be being that, um, well, I guess, you know, the standard sort of Let's Play notion of, I'm just going to talk all over this and mm -hmm. talk for the sake of talking, and I'll make a poor joke at the expense of what's going on, and it kind of just ruins the moment. Yeah. Uh, and um, it ruins the moment it, in games with less emotional impact than that. <laughs> How's it going to work well, here? Well, that's the thing. There seems to be this notion in Let's Play that, like, you just have to keep fucking talking. You've got to no justify the fact that you're there, you know? Right, yeah. 
And that's, like, what annoys me about shit like that, though, is I, I do feel like with a Let's Play like that, um, it rather than showing off the game, that is sort of a direct example of just using the game as your own... I mean, I wrote about this, but, like, using the game as, as I guess, your own... A platform for your own self-promotion, yeah. you know? And I think that's what kind of bugs me about not all, but a lot of scare cam type videos or videos where the camera's on the player as well. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I see they'll put the actual video and video, uh, they'll use video and video, put on top of the gameplay footage, which even if it's only blocking a little bit, kind of calls out to me like, hey, I'm more important than the game yeah. behind me right now. And then lately they go even crazier and put like annotations to all their other fucking videos running through the goddamn video. And it's like, it's just directly like, I don't give a shit for whoever the fuck designed this game or whatever. I'm here. I'm the star of the show, you know? Yeah. I, the funny thing about scare cams is you know, there's a couple of points to bring up. One being the fact that you just, they just shove their face in there and make no effort to actually, <laughs> like, even just p create a little overlay or frame for the camera. It's just this giant block that completely yeah. shatters the aesthetic of the game. It's like, this has no place here. You didn't even make an effort. I remember I did a, <laughs> I think it was a, it was an interview slash playthrough with the developer mm -hmm. of DayZ. And the way that I wanted to do that, because it is a game where, you know, panic can be induced. And I thought maybe for once there was actually some value in showing the faces of myself and the developer. And we thought, well, Absolutely. let's design this overlay that makes it look, you know, that uses the same kind of aesthetic as mm -hmm. day z does and we'll use that instead of just shoving our faces somewhere on the screen and that seemed to go down pretty well but even these guys that do nothing but scare cam lps don't even make that kind of effort i'm like really if this is what you're doing on a regular basis could you at least not try and make it look like it's not sticking out like a sore thumb and you know the thing I wonder too is, does this scare cam actually need to be there for a hundred percent of the playthrough mm, like it, it yeah. you know i mean the, t the typical example, of course, is the horror game, but you have a lot of downtime in horror games. Yeah. You know, at least in good ones, I find, there is a lot of build-up where there's not monsters, there's little sounds here and there. And if you're actually not saying anything in particularly important or doing anything, like, well, why does it have to even be there? Well, because it would take a lot more editing if you removed it from <laughs> certain parts. You know, it's easier just to <laughs> record it with your Logitech and slap it over the top and not really have to worry too much about it. But, right. but I think the funny thing about Scarecam LPs is, like, to, to a very small degree, I think mm -hmm. the inclusion of the Let's Player there and his face is probably more valid than it would be in certainly a game like Brothers. It's like, I am watching this Scarecam LP, if I happen to like that stuff, to mm -hmm. watch you get scared because it's kind of funny, you know? Right. It's, it's a bit of lowbrow right. humor. It's easy. It's low-hanging fruit. I am not mm -hmm. watching you play Brothers to hear your <laughs> shitty jokes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing, and you think like you tailor the let's play to the game, yeah. you know, yeah. and you you know because like um another one uh so I, I talk up Chip Cheesem's uh, Metal Gear Rising as well one, you right? fucking should because it's fantastic. Yeah. It is fantastic. Please go watch that now, people listening to this. Close the window or whatever. But um, uh, and what he does is he plays it. And he's really an expert, knows everything about the game, and his friend General Ironicus doesn't know anything. So you, a lot of times during the really cool action scenes, you hear him, like, kind of happy, but it adds to something. Because you're also getting that, you know, hey, the, you can see, like, the, a player, you know what I mean, like, reacting to some of the cool stuff. Yeah, and but that enthusiasm can be infectious. Absolutely, yeah. But conversely, they know when to shut up for, like, some of the other scenes. And also, if you like, you also get to give you option of the full commentary version. But, you know, there it's tailored for the Let's Play, or it's tailored for the game, you know what I mean? Yeah, certainly. And I think that's why when you go on, say, the essay forums, in my experience, mm -hmm. there are those Let's Plays where it's blindingly obvious that that was the game that guy was meant to play. Yeah, Maybe he never does like a, another Let's Play ever, but it's because he has such a connection to that game in some way. Either he just knows it back to front, or maybe it had some impact on his life, or he had a really great idea about how to present it, and it just it blows everything else out of the water. And as a result, it's a really incredible thing to watch. That's exactly it, yeah. It's it's ex exactly right. But I think the problem is now that people get... Well, what happens is now people get sort of enamored with the concept of Let's Play, and they want to just do everything. And then they want to compete with other people yeah. on YouTube. They get, a, for... they get enamored as, of the concept of Let's Play as a career. Mm -hmm. That's where that oh, actually yeah. comes from, I think. Well, I think they... Yeah, and they feel like it's, it's money just to play video games, yeah. you know? Which it Whereas, is. Whereas, like, it can... Yeah, well, okay, true. 
But I mean, like, uh, you can see though too. I mean, even when I know you don't, uh, you primarily don't do let's plays or anything like that. Try but, to avoid it. Uh, right. Exactly. I'm sorry. I, I said I try to try to avoid it. Right. Kind of go, go a little bit too far over the line from time to time, but. Exactly. But um, I mean, I, I know you know from like uh, video uh, producing videos that have to do with video games, and you know, I have some experience with that. Like, it's not easy money per se if you want to do really good work. You know, it's not just record the video game, spout off hit transcode, upload, but then that's what people are doing nowadays, and they want to beat each other to the punch, so rather than picking a game they really like, they pick a game like, oh shit, Saints Row 4 just came out, Better time to upload. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's exa- th- it's a yeah. bandwagoning, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's probably mm-hmm. the best way to describe it. There's a reason why SA Forums had a rule that stopped you from playing. I mean, that's still there, right? That there's a rule that yeah. stopped playing the game. Is it, what, three months, six months? Three months. Three months, three months yeah. Now. It used to be six, yeah. I think. A long time ago. Um, yeah. Well, you know, one thing I will say for the essay forums, and um, and I have gotten some feedback to say um, recently that we might be a little too tightly wound, so we're working on that a bit, but we're very self-policing there, so I have actually even considered shortening the, the rule even, because I feel like nowadays, if someone came in with like, hey, I've got my launch day, let's play, a lot of the people on the forum would be like, how could you possibly Yeah, they just good? shit on them for it. Yeah, and rightfully exactly. so. I, I, I mean, I've been on the receiving end of that, and rightfully so as well. When I <laughs> screwed up on that forum, and yeah, you know, and I learned a lot mm-hmm. from that, and I think it's it's very valuable. I, I don't necessarily think that you guys are, are too kind of tightly wound, as you said, about the way that the videos are presented. I know it's just video mm-hmm. games on the internet, and that's not really a big deal. Mm-hmm. But it's like well, in the country of the blind, the one I'm on, one-eyed man is king, right? And there's so right. there's so few good ones outside of there. That you know, it's nice that there's a place that has some standards because it produces a well, different kind of video. Well, you know, we went. The thing is too that um, YouTube is kind of this place where there's islands of popularity. Like there yeah. can be a popular let's player you've never even heard exactly. of, even if you've been watching for years. Yeah. And it there's not there's not like places to build a foundation or learn from things because you know on essay at least it's all in a central place. Mm-hmm. So. We've kind of went through a lot of the steps that a lot of YouTube Let's Players and people even watching them have, you know? We went we went through our motion of, oh my god, everything is great, because people, they get they love the video game, so if someone Let's Plays it, they automatically love the Let's Play. Or they like somebody's previous video, so if someone does another game, they like that video also. Yeah. Or, or they like Let's Play in general, and they just want to support it. So you had this big hug box going on, and people who raise their hand and go, you know, by the way, if you transcoded this in H.264, mm-hmm. it would look a lot crisper, just get shot down because they don't want to be haters or whatever, you know? Yeah, and that's exactly it, isn't it? You don't have a culture of good constructive criticism. And more to the point, even if you did, a lot of the people watching it wouldn't have any to give. Hey, no, you're absolutely right. And and we went through that at a point, you know, because um, I remember back in the day, uh, Deceased Crab was like, uh, he was a big he was getting big on YouTube, yep. or, you know, and he was big on SA. But um, he did a Let's Play of a game called Tyrion 2000. I don't know if you've it's ever heard of that. It's a shooter, or... right? Yeah, to shoot him up. And this is back, because back in 2007, 2008, YouTube actually didn't have the HD option. You couldn't go past 11 minutes unless you were grandfathered in. Mm-hmm. It was actually not a wonderful host for video game footage. No, it wasn't. Right, and especially because of the episode length or whatever, it was a very bad place for Let's Play, because... You know, if you want to have a self-contained chapter, 11 minutes is kind of short. Yeah. If you can't fit it in, you're just kind of screwed. Mm-hmm. And a lot of Let's Players, of course, would solve that by just chopping it. But um, a lot of people complained about Crab's Tyrion video because it shoot him up uh, with, like, the bullets flying everywhere. It, it kind of lost something uh, in the resolution, you know? And yeah. people were complaining, like, this is a high-def game. Like, you, if you put this on Vimeo, at, when they allowed video game footage at the time, yeah. Daily Motion, Blitz, you know. Yeah. Exactly. You know, this would look a lot better, but he was very married to YouTube, and then his fans were very married to him, so it ended up being like a whole big drama fest or whatever, which ended up resulting in me getting the moderator position. But uh, but that was the problem, is that like we had like these sort of cults of personality, and then, you know, when you sort of have more standards and you've been, th- you've s- been there, done that, and seen it, it's a little harder for that to take hold, you know? Like, even I, even I put a, a try to let's play of um, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream in the Sandcastle, and I got kind of shut down because I'll be, it wasn't as well-planned as I would have liked it, you know, and I didn't have quite of a good direction for wanting to take it. But, you know, it's good because you get that feedback, and rather than spend, you know, weeks, like, trying to do something that you really want to stand behind and it's really good, 
you know, you kind of figure, okay, well, if I'm told at the beginning I can take this in a different direction or try something, you end up with a better product. I mean, the fact that you, you know? guys even have the Sandcastle is leagues ahead of everything else. <laughs> if you look at alternatives to the SAD, say, Let's Play forum, you'd look at something like the sub. there's a Let's Play subreddit. It's not very big, but mm-hmm. it's full of people that are either posting their own stuff, which is not okay. that helpful because then other people just downvote it because they want their stuff to be more famous. And <laughs> there's a, you, you should know you know this guy, a Northern Lion. He you know yeah. who has done three thousand episodes of Finding of Isaac. <laughs> Finding of Isaac. It, right. To be fair, he's very very good at it, and inexplicably people still watch it. So more power to him. But he po- he often posts there to try and help people. And I look through his Reddit account, and half of his posts are downvoted. Like, most of them to the point where they wouldn't be seen. Why? Because he had the audacity to say that someone might have been doing something wrong and proposing a way to resolve it from the experience of someone who manages to support his family by doing full-time YouTube. As in, someone who knows what the hell he's talking about. It's right, it's right. nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. No, say what you will about full-time YouTube, but if you're there, you are probably you probably have an idea of what the hell you're talking about. Generally you know? speaking, yeah, because for everyone that is doing it full-time, there's thousands that aren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know it's funny, Northern Lion. I was actually I uh, I made fun of him once on Twitter for it. He's a cool guy. He, or whatever, he, oh, he took that in stride. He actually. Oh yeah, uh, and I love that because it's like you got to be able to laugh at yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, video games on the internet. <laughs> that, yeah, that's exactly. awesome. What's your career path? <laughs> I can just imagine you being a grandfather. Your grandkids are sitting in you. What did you do in the Great War, Daddy? The binding of <laughs> Isaac mostly. <laughs> <laughs> By Great War, you do mean Call of Duty, right? Naturally. You know, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to say? It's funny, though, because I actually uh, I did look into some of his stuff to see if I could read to pray it, but I don't know. Nothing too offensive struck out about it. Like, he knew a lot about the games, you know? And Generally pretty good at it. He live streams a lot, which helps him a lot in the kind of stream of consciousness thing. Oh, uh, okay. I've actually... Well, Diabetes and I have started doing some live streaming stuff because I've played around with it in the past before, but he's really into it now. You do and it on Max, though, right? Or does Diabetes use a PC for it? <laughs> Diabetes not only uses a PC, but gives me so much shit for using <laughs> a Mac. It's not even funny. And um, last podcast, I had to shamefacedly agree, um, I cannot get my MacBook Pro to stream properly. I, uh, I can't even imagine. It's enough of a pain in the ass on PC we we have mm-hmm. essentially three programs, XSplit that doesn't work half the time, OBS, <laughs> which is incomplete and doesn't work half the time, and Wirecast, which is expensive and does weird shit. So Um on Mac you kinda have this sort of like fra- you have to sort of Frankenstein a bunch of stuff together. Oh, you don't have to run uh, Flash Media Live Encoder or anything, do you? Oh I do. Oh my. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Back in the day it's... on livestream.com. Oh, <laughs> I um I I run that and then I I use uh, Cam Twist which is desktop um it basically tricks you know virtual says, cameras like, yeah. there you are thank you and uh, I have line in and all that set up so the best I've gotten is I can hear myself in my headphones when I speak through the audio rerouting I still haven't figured out how to do that but I've just gotten used to talking like that now. It used to be the most distracting thing in the world, but now, you know, hey, it's not so bad. Oh, man. I mean, if it's, if it's, I, I couldn't live without zero latency monitoring now. And just, I always hear myself in my headphones, but it's zero latency, so it's irrelevant. <laughs> you know, if, if there was anything off about that, that would throw me completely. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I, I just, I tune it out, but we've been doing streams, and I like, um, I, I streamed Cookie Clicker at one point. Oh, yeah. So I was just so frustrated. No, I'm, but, uh, but I like streams too because there's more of an active audience there. So like if you have you know you have chat going on, you can refer to you know things like that. Um, we kind of do it like a call-in show. Mm-hmm. We're sort of like playing the video game, and uh, then we'll bring people in and we'll let them like promote their channel or plug whatever they like and just talk bullshit with us. You know, that's probably the best way to do it. I feel like if you're going to do a live stream, you can't create the same kind of content as you are for YouTube. And even if oh, yeah. you, I, every now and again, I'll. If I've done a stream or something, I'll cut up VODs and kind of put them on YouTube, and they'll generally do all right, but it's mm-hmm. not the same. And if you make content on a live stream that's blatantly aimed at YouTube, it doesn't resonate as well. Last night, no. I was actually doing a, I did six, I, for some reason, did six hours of Hearthstone. I was playing mm-hmm. the arena mode, and I would let the viewers pick which class, and I would be able to see their, the chat and all of their suggestions and all of the plays they think I should do. 95% of them, of course, are completely wrong. But <laughs> being able to react to that live while also trying to play 
it was pretty cool mm. and also if a particularly good play went off or it was a good game there'd be a reaction in the chat and it does shape the way that the video actually comes out at the end rather than just doing it on your own with no audience right no agreed um it, it, and it is a different feel, and it took me a while to get used to it, because I feel like I kind of try to be a perfectionist about certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, I'm tone deaf, so audio is not one of them. But usually when I'm trying to when I'm talking over a video game, I like to try to think of things to say, all that stuff. So when you're streaming, you can't really do that, no. because you're managing a million things, you know. So it took me a while to just sort of go like, ugh, all right, forget it, let all that shit go, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just cash, you know? Yeah, you've got to accept that in a live stream, you're not going to be able to have the, the amount of control that you want. And mm-hmm. that's why you should just try and produce different content while you're doing it live. And that can make the best of that, I suppose. Right. Well, you know, I mean, the one thing, too, is I've noticed part of the feedback I got about this essay forums uh, is that, like, a lot of Let's Players there are going to streaming because they feel like the standards are too high where they can't just do, like, a fuck-around kind of video. Mm-hmm. To which I'd say, like, you can absolutely do a fuck-around video. Like, we do like to just have fun and screw around. If you look at, um, say, like, Archimp Cola and Sinatra Pod's yeah. Resident Evil 5 Let's Play, that's a, it's hysterically funny. It You know, and it's at the very least, it's technically sound. It may not be, like, the best playthrough. I don't know that they show off all the medals and all that stuff, you know? But it's it's fun to watch. All, all that you need, all you need to do is get your workflow somewhat down. You know what I mean? Or just listen to people when they say to you, like, "Don't do it like this," just because it's, you're just making your work harder for you. You know? Yeah. And even then, you're talking about the kind of, there's even standards for fuck around let's plays, right? Because the essay mm-hmm. forums are can be pretty harsh on people they don't deem to be funny. Well, you know what it is too. Like a, a big thing on with YouTube Let's Play is you get the notion that all I need to do is talk. So you have kind of people, like, uh, they get together, they try to emulate Game Grumps, Two Best Friends, whatever, yeah. but then they start just bullshitting about their day, and then it's like the game is just this background thing, and it's and that's that's what really sets people from S- on SA off, because it's like, well, why the fuck are you even including the video game yeah. then? Yeah, it's you like, know? your your day-to-day routine is more important than what's going on on screen, really? Right. That's di- I mean, well, that's disrespectful. It is, it's stupid. I mean, yeah, the video wouldn't fucking exist without the game yeah, in the first place. Exactly. Like, yeah, I have to. I mean, I really have to wonder, like, how what game developers feel about you know, like, like let's play in general. Really, I'm sure it varies from developer to developer, but even ones like that where you kind of want to like yell at them, like, so you're going to show off my footage, my you know characters, like my art assets, all that stuff, and you're not even going to refer to it or yeah. tell people at least how to fucking buy it. Yeah, I've, sp- I've spoken to a good number of devs. I mean, over the past couple of years, about the way that video games are portrayed on YouTube. And mm-hmm. Let's Play doesn't usually come up all that often, but mm-hmm. when it does, they they seem to have more of a, a kind of reserved attitude to it and will happily say, we really like it from a marketing standpoint. This especially I, applies to indies. Right. But I get to... Yeah, right. I was, all I was going to say after that was... We don't. They don't really go all out and say, "Yeah, we totally love that people do this." It seems like they shy away from saying, "Yeah, we'd prefer that some people didn't." <laughs> <laughs> that's well. That's where it gets tricky, right? Because, I mean, of course, it's good marketing for you, unless, say, you know, you like you do a launch day let's play with, let's say, a scare cam. I'm just throwing this out there, by the way. I don't have one in mind, but you know. You do a launch day let's play of a relatively short game with a scare cam, you talk all over it, and people flock to it immediately. You have to say at some point, like, this is kind of shooting myself in the foot. Whereas you get then someone else who did the research, knows what the hell they're talking about, shows you the proper way to play through, you know, the game or things you might not have known about, and it just compliments it, you know? Like, it, it's probably very positive then, so... I guess it just it, it sucks because there's probably a lot of a lot of let's plays that could help support the game or whatever, but sometimes you don't get to see that because you know, yeah, it's a big. <laughs> and there's a lot of it. What's very weird about YouTube LP now is I feel like there it's going through a phase now where there's a ton of competition, and people are doing a lot of doing different things to sort of get themselves like rise above the. You know what I mean? Yeah, above the phone. I mean, th- th- there's so much bandwagoning going on right now that. 
there are some people that are trying to find what the next bandwagon is going to be. Uh, even the, right. our, our YouTube network, Polaris, often tries mm-hmm. to do that and thinks of different formats to try and make that happen and also looks to try and grab the next, basically the next PewDiePie or whatever because right. obviously there's a lot of money in a personality like that. And if you can get them for your network, you're going to make money off them and that's going to help you mm-hmm. grow your brand and so on and so forth. But be, as you as you said, because people are all just doing the same thing over and over again and will bandwagon on the latest game that they think will get them hits and views, right? it is now getting to the point where perhaps that just won't, it can't support itself anymore. It, there's so much of the same thing that whoever breaks out is going to be the mm-hmm. big deal. I mean, you think about Scarecam. Scarecam right. wasn't really around a few years ago. The, no. It, the whole Amnesia thing is interesting because back when Amnesia first came out, when it wasn't getting a huge amount of attention on YouTube, I did a Halloween scare thingy because I just felt like it at the time. And mm-hmm. it was just an hour of it. I mean, I hate horror games. I'm a complete pussy, so <laughs> I, I, I lasted about an hour. People ate that damn thing up. But mm-hmm. then I watched that, and then about a couple of weeks later, you started seeing videos of the same game all over the place, and then someone puts the camera in. And mm-hmm. then it really goes insane in terms of the, the number of people that were watching it. And then, obviously, if you take PewDiePie as an example, the two mm-hmm. things that he does from an editing standpoint are that, and he will put subtitles in to accent particular uh, things that he says. Yep. Because apparently, yeah. I mean, I don't see the humor value in that, but apparently that resonates with some people for some reason. And that took things in a different direction. Now, of course, everybody does that, but... Right. That was a breakthrough moment for certain people, him being one of them. Well, you know, I could see the whole, like, uh, scare camp thing in terms of it per- It marries Let's Play with the, um, remember those two girls, one cup reaction yeah. videos on yeah. you? Yeah, you know? And it, 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 in that sense, too, it could work in terms of, like, hey, look how scary, you know, amnesia is. And you could say, like, totally, like, actually, that really helps market the game if everybody is making reaction videos yes. to it, you know? Yeah. But then when the gimmick becomes, oh, I'm so scared. I'm not calling on him in particular. I'm saying in general. You know, um, oh, the game is so scary. Ah, I'm freaking out. To, like, every fucking horror game, then it kind of loses something. Because there's certainly horror games out there, too, that aren't that scary. But people do it to sort of jump on that bandwagon, you know? Yeah, I have a feeling that that's maybe going the way of the dodo. I was looking at the stats and the chart placements for stuff like Machine for Pigs. Because obviously that came mm-hmm. out recently, so like, oh, this is the this is the next big bandwagon. You would sure. think, but it's yeah. not. It's actually being beaten out in that respect by Outlast, which is very strange. And then, yeah. and then I remember you tweeted a few weeks ago, you retweeted the Chinese room after PewDiePie, ac- I think ac- it was either accidental or not, but whatever the case, he resolved mm-hmm. the issue and all credit to him for that. You know, he dealt with that well. But the fact that he posted a large amount of the Machine for Pigs prior to it coming out, and Chinese Room was not happy with that. And That's the... Sorry. Go ahead. What I was going to say was that it's the Chinese Room, and they're very, very story-driven. And Amnesia Machine for Pigs is much, much shorter, much more linear. And I have to wonder if in that scenario, the thing that you just described could happen, the idea that if there are too many Let's Plays early on of a game like this, it actually does harm the title as opposed to elevating it and actually making it sell more copies. So here's what worries me, is if uh, an alternate world, or not really, but like, if the Chinese Room didn't, if a Ninja Machine for Pigs doesn't sell well, and Chinese Room says, you know what, no wonder it didn't sell well, all these fucking people shows show everyone the complete game on YouTube, and so no, no one's gonna buy it. You know what I mean? They, yeah. And they convince people like, look, we lost sales due to Let's Play, and that becomes a slide in someone's PowerPoint presentation and all that. Then you are gonna see more of like Nintendo, mm-hmm. God forbid, Sega, that shit. You know, uh, cracking down on people and saying, no, 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 no footage, or at the very least, we're gonna run ads on your footage, or we're gonna use the YouTube copyright thing to take your video down completely. Yeah, the, you know? the Chinese Room's an interesting one, because if you look at their previous game, Dear Esther, I feel that mm-hmm. that's a game that you could experience in full by just watching a Let's Play that didn't have commentary, because the experience right. is basically the same regardless. It's a, you press W to move through the environment, that's really about it. Machine for Pigs <laughs> takes a lot of those ideas, because they stripped out a lot of the gameplay compared to The Dark Descent, and a lot of people didn't like that either. And well, you, you could argue that, yes, in that scenario, maybe a Let's Play does stop some people from playing it. Well, you know, I mean, I think it, it again, depends on the game, depends on the Let's Play and things like that. Because 
Uh, well, it's, it's tricky with A Machine for Pigs or, or really more Dear Esther, it sounds like, because you have this sort of very linear experience, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tougher sell to say that, like, Let's Play helps that. But, you know, it happens. I mean, one of the strange things that happened to me was I, I did a Let's Play of a Nintendo DS game called Sprung. Which I don't know if you've ever heard that of was, that game. That was a really old... That was, a, was that even a launch title, I think? It was a dating game, uh, right? Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, Ubisoft decided to try to enter the dating... Or bring the dating suit market to the West. And it was a terrible game. <laughs> it's completely linear. Completely... It, they try to give you choices. And it's just awful, awful. And I did this Let's Play of it where I just tore it a new asshole... And, like, I wrote it from the perspective of the main character, how fucking nothing seemed to make sense in his world, and, you know, all this stuff. And then, uh... But people bought the game! Yeah. They were like, this is hilarious! I want a copy of Sprung! And I'm like, no, you don't! <laughs> that was the point! No! But, um... We had a similar thing with Ride to Hell Retribution, actually. And <laughs> a bunch of people tried to bandwagon that game, and couldn't finish it, because it was so bad that they couldn't even justify <laughs> doing it for cash. <laughs> it's like, it's that terrible. <laughs> well, I guess that must be like a thing with like, when you hear about how horrible Big Rigs is, oh, you know, it's like, yeah. oh, I got to get a copy of that just to see for myself. <laughs> yeah, th those are some of the very few number of games that transcend so bad it's good into, no, there is no redeeming factor about this game. <laughs> you will not find entertainment value here. It's n not going to happen at all. But it's, it's, in, it's so bad, it's not even good at being bad. Exactly. To but in the case of Sprung, I think it's that's a game that's awful, admittedly, but it's quirky mm -hmm. in a, enough of a way that people might be able to throw down a few bucks for it, considering it's going for next to nothing. So they end up doing it, it that way. It keeps your interest. And that's like another reason that I'm against sort of like, not against them entirely, mind you, but like, I, I always kind of cock an eye at blind Let's Plays and launch day Let's Plays because you really have to pick games that are, are at least keep the player's interest yeah. because it's, it's going to come down to the viewer, too. And if all you're doing is playing a game where you get trash mob after trash mob, you're going to run out of shit to talk about eventually. Yeah, you know? I mean, some people know that the way that I started doing this professionally was World of Warcraft stuff. And that was more specifically mm -hmm. coverage of the expansion from the perspective of someone that had played like six years of the game. And mm -hmm. even then, when people want to see dungeon runs, I would always speed them up two times and then cut vast chunks out of it. And even then, doing post-commentary, I'd run out of things to say. So if you're doing right. hours and hours of a game like that, there is no way you are going to stay interesting on a blind Let's Play without experience. It's not going to happen. Well, that, and that's the thing. And there's so many, like, Pokemon Let's Plays out there where a lot of that game is random encounters, looking for a specific... You know, I want my shiny, I don't really play it, uh, Bellsprout, whatever, yes. you know. Most yeah, powerful so. Pokemon, so I'm told, yeah. <laughs> I will say he is very cute. That is one concession I will give Pokemon, is I like Bellsprout. But, um, no, uh, 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 Chugga Conroy, though, is smart about it. He cuts out a lot of the random battles, you know. He uh, highlights the Pokemon that he meets and things like that. You know, he really, like, goes out and shows the effort involved. Yeah. Whereas, that's the problem, I think, with a lot of RPG Let's Plays is... Again, people kind of use it. Some people just use it as a surrogate. I was going to play this video game anyway. I might as well record it so I get either ad revenue or fame. You know what I mean? So they don't really know what to say. So you get these sort of like, oh, whoa, kind of thing. Like, you know, the half monosyllabic kind of commentary. Yeah. Where they're not really saying anything at all. So, you know, because it, 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 takes, it takes that effort. You know, it does take the editing and everything like that. Yeah, if you want to produce a good quality product. And if you just want to throw the game out just for ad revenue, then... I don't think you can necessarily expect people to either take you seriously or give you any kind of respect for doing that, because it gets back to what mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. The game is a platform for your own self-promotion, as opposed right. to you respecting the game and you adding to the experience in some way. Right. Well, you know, I mean, again, it, and it comes back to, too, like, you know, uh, pe people, I think, too, will get, eventually get bored, bored of that, you know? I would think so. Or it's like... It's like the, uh, the I Want to Be the Guy fad. Yeah. You know, because e everyone loved watching those because... Somebody would die at the game, and they'd, and they'd get frustrated and mm -hmm. angry. Like, that that was, like, the big, like, thing. And then people would pretend, of course, to get frustrated Yeah, it's, and it's angry, the rage you know? quit idea, isn't it? It's, yeah. And I'll admit, like, the first time you see that, it seems pretty funny, mm -hmm. right, to watch someone, like, bang their head against it. But 
five minutes later, it's not as funny, you know, because it's been like, all right, I, I get it. Let's move on and see something new. But then you'd have these I Want to Be the Guy Let's Plays that last like an hour stuck on one boss because, you know, it's a fuck off game that's meant to... I, I, I don't even want to say be difficult. That's not really fair. It's meant to sort of cheat you out of lives. Yeah. Maybe. Or time. It is flat <laughs> unfair. There's no question. It's designed Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, No, it's, a, it's an in-joke that kind of upstays its welcome a little. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, though. I've heard people say, like, uh, when they talk about level design stuff, I want to be the guy who actually has good ideas in it. It's just that, I mean, the, the joke in it, whatever, is just so overriding, you can't possibly, you know? Yes, yeah. But, like, if you look, there's, like, little nuggets. Of, there's little, there's diamonds in the rough there. Like, some of the levels that are just spikes with the elevator moving, they're, like, actually, it's pretty good level design, but, of course... Then a couch comes out of nowhere and crushes you. Yeah, so pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I know apparently if the sequel or chapter one of the sequel came out or something. I don't know. Because I know those I want to be the guy Gaiden, which I know that I came say, out yeah. and that was damn infuriating. I, <laughs> I'm not sure if they're continuing to make it. You know what? Actually, something you mentioned, which I, I just I cannot fathom the fad of Happy Wheels. I'm gonna be frank because <laughs> I, I decided to look through because I was thinking, hmm, you know, how valid is the idea that this kind of stuff is starting to die out and get less interest? But then mm-hmm. I, I look up Happy Wheels, you know, and there's a few popular Let's Players that continue to make Happy Wheels series, and we're still looking at 250 to 300 thousand views a video minimum on these things. I'm like, what more is there to see? <laughs> I, I I think it has to do with children and the childish, if you want to know the truth. I mean, Happy Wheels, uh, the game itself, uh, I think, is fine for a like, little fuck-around time-waster type of thing. And um, the guy who made it, um, shit, I'm blanking on his name. I used to know it. But uh, I'll tell you this. He made a game called Divine Intervention uh-huh. for Flash. Actually, a pretty good shooter. Re- really hard. Um, you pretty much have to cheat to win okay. it. But you know, he's he's not a bad designer, and this was, seems like a, a game you made to sort of fuck around with physics engines, user-generated content, and all that, you know? I, so I have nothing against the game in particular, but it's quote-unquote gory, you know? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a fuck-around thing to watch, you'll laugh at. So then, people, I think, sort of exploit that adolescent part of it, and then they add funny, like, voices. And even if they do the same things over and over again, you know, I guess people just still keep clicking, because it's like... Yay, my favorite character, meaning the guy in the corner, is playing this wacky game and there's user-generated content, you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, um... Or it's like when they do Let's Plays of, like, Akinator or Cleverbot or something. Where then it's just like... (laughs) That is just Let's Play this search engine thingy. Yeah, that's... I I don't even know what to say about that stuff, you know? (laughs) But, um, somebody, by the way, met the creator of Happy Wheels at PAX... Uh, and apparently, uh, he said something to the effect of, because of all the Let's Plays, it doesn't really feel like his game anymore. And I, it was sort of a double-edged sword, from my understanding. I heard this conversation secondhand. But, um, you know, where, on the one hand, he's happy it was popular, and it's sort of gotten out of his hands in the way. But in the other, he's, you know, some of the Let's Players in particular, he is not a fan of. Well, I mean, that doesn't oh. really surprise me. You know, a lot of <laughs> Happy Wheels Let's Players are obnoxious. And oh, well, yeah. they play on that. Very much so. And to be fair, you're talking about a very obnoxious game. And mm-hmm. you know, you're hardly going to do it in a classy fashion. Although I think that could be a great little mini series. Be as classy as possible about Happy Wheels for six episodes. <laughs> Go. Yeah, talk to very seriously about game art direction and design. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I tried a little of that because I, I did sort of a parody of Happy Wheels Let's Plays called uh, Easy Money. <laughs> where um, That's, no, that's not a parody. <laughs> or I couldn't even, well actually no, um, I couldn't even bring myself by the way to put the scare cam over the game I, I pushed it to the side Oh my! basically so like um, and for the first minute I talked about everything I'd read on Wikipedia and Happy Wheels and it's like that's about all the commentary I could really think if I were genuinely trying to do it to squeeze out of it you know what I mean Yeah, I, I, like, there's, even, there's not much space for that <laughs> stuff in a game like that yeah even now I think I've just talked more about Happy Wheels than I could have if I were trying to do of course, now I feel like I'm being challenged, so I kind of have to do But anyway, we'll see. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what was I going to say? Let me ask you this. I, this is something I've been curious about. Because right. uh, you're, a, you're a popular guy. Um, do you feel like... Because I think a lot of YouTubers who want to get a lot of subscriptions, want to get a lot of viewers, for right or wrong reasons, um, they, wanna, they try to promote themselves or whatever. Do you feel you're at a level where you don't really have to do that anymore? 
or have you made it more or less? I guess I think so. I, I, we don't actively promote ourselves on the internet in any way. If there's any promotion that's going on, it's by being at an event of some description. Okay, like I say, part of doing the whole StarCraft commentary, uh, you know, doing professional commentary on these big esports events is Mm -hmm. our brand being out there at an event is a strong thing because it often shows to sponsors and companies that are looking at that kind of event, this person can do a good job. This person Mm -hmm. can act professionally in front of a large audience. This is not what you're seeing in general on YouTube, which is just people screaming into a microphone. It is is sports commentary. It's the same thing. This guy is showing up in a suit with good manner and is using Mm -hmm. proper broadcast technique and so on and so forth and that's the kind of thing that gets us noticed by the people that we want to get noticed by promoting to other gamers right now is kind of pointless Uh i mean if you think about how ineffective the usual method of promoting yourself to gamers is like posting on a forum hey come watch my video or posting in youtube comments that the good old copy pasta that goes something along (laughs) the lines of i know you guys find this really annoying but it's really hard for a new youtuber to blah 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 you know (laughs) right 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 and I we never even when I was growing as a channel and we we're starting to bring in the money we never actively promoted ourselves because honestly mm-hmm. YouTube is viral by nature so those videos find their way around without your just being completely out of your control right so you mm-hmm. don't need to promote you just need to keep producing the same kind of content and es- right. essentially it will steamroll itself after a while ah interesting do you do you feel like there is a point where you crossed that line and said, like, now I'm in. I'm in the circle or whatever. You know, was, did you get recognized somewhere you didn't expect to? Did it Was it just, I don't know, you started showing up in recommendations for things? It was a little weird for me because I used to do the fan site thing for ages. Still, while I was mm-hmm. posting on SA, I was running WoW Radio and doing the World of Warcraft podcast thing. And that mm-hmm. was sort of micro internet fame i guess on a really small scale it was still it was a very listened to podcast i think it was the second most popular or something like that but even then it was it was a little weird but i'd I'd still run into people sometimes i on the street or whatever that would recognize me by voice they never recognized me by face because they didn't know what i looked like but they maybe would hear my voice or whatever and it's like oh i listened to your show and that was really really cool it's not yeah definitely it's just the same as that really now just on a larger scale because i've got a larger audience so I don't, mm-hmm. I don't really know of the point when it tipped because mm-hmm. I was doing all this stuff as a hobby prior to doing it professionally. Right. But, and, I mean, you never, you're never at, like, the grocery store or anything where, like, somebody comes up to you and you're like, oh, my God, you know, uh, total biscuit. I fucking, what are you doing here? I thought you were British. You know, that kind of thing. But um, <laughs> not, not in uh, North Carolina. Uh, there are definitely right, yeah. places where that's happened, though, especially if you're in town for a convention you will yeah, run into yeah. people everywhere that that will know who you are, which is cool. There's not, I mean, that's <laughs> it's an awesome feeling. Don't get me wrong, uh, but oh, I mean, thankfully around here, there's not a huge amount of that. There's a bit more of it in right. the UK because I think there's a larger concentration of my audience there versus the population, and obviously it's you know it's a smaller country. Well, uh, uh, North Carolina is interesting because I think it's technically the northernmost su- so, part. Yeah, of the it's South. like the northernmost southern state, isn't it? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I have to imagine a lot's backwards there, and there's a lot of, you know, pigs, like, bringing telephone wire back and forth. I, I don't watch the news we, or anything. It so. is a machine for pigs. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's true. Um, <laughs> do, you watch, uh, do you watch regular sports to help you with eSports commentary? No. I, I, never, I just never really found it interesting. It's, I, I can't really think of anything that I would have watched aside from just big stuff like the World Cup. And it's, it's the same in the UK. If you don't watch... Football, you're going to watch the World Cup, right? You're going to watch the right. finals of something. It even works it's... that way for esports as well. But a bunch of people tuned in for the international three finals, mm-hmm. way more so than we're watching the regular event, just because, hey, it's a big event right, and it's right. competitive. So I feel like I should watch it, you know? No, I hear you. I'm kind of the same way with uh, football and baseball. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'm, I'm big for the playoffs, the World Series, you know, Super Bowl, all that. But before that, I could, it's kind of, eh, if it's on, maybe. Yeah, but, same. Yeah, exactly. But do you ever then, like, watch a sports game, hear the commentary, and go, those, like, is it, like, does it work out similarly? Like, those guys do what I do, you know? <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. It's, it's interesting looking at the dynamic of those, because esports commentary versus regular sports commentary is a little different in the way that, mm-hmm. obviously, a regular sport has a lot more logistical support in the background. 
and you've got guys whose sole job is to feed stats, yeah? And then you've got yeah. a guy who is the stats man who is getting stats fed to him, but also has a lot of knowledge and does a little bit of his own research. And then you've got your analyst or your color commentator, and then you've got your play-by-play guy who's generally not an ex-sportsman. He's usually a broadcast personality that's come in from news or radio or something along those lines because he has that voice and he has that ability to deliver that information concisely and quickly and just be able to pass all that information on a second-by-second basis and express it to the crowd without falling over his own words, which is a skill. And for for esports, it's usually a two-commentator setup, and you don't have that kind of support. So you maybe have to know a bit more, I would say, to be to be effective at it. But aside from that, it's a pretty similar idea. Now, in Brazil, when they do East, when they do sports commentating, they tend to get really into it and yell yeah. goal mm-hmm. and things like that. Is there a Brazilian esports equivalent? A Brazilian esports equivalent, as in the game or a commentator that's like that? I just want a Hispanic man to yell at me <laughs> when I watch esports is what I'm getting. No, um... <laughs> I've heard actually StarCraft uh, is, is huge in Korea is the thing. I guess everybody knows that, it, right? It's funny because that's a bit of a myth. And oh! It's, StarCraft 2 is actually not big in Korea at all. It is one of, it's not one of the least popular esports, but as a game that's both played and watched, it's nowhere mm-hmm. near as popular as a lot of other games. The whole Brood War fanaticism died off kind of years ago, really. And st- it still produces the best players. Uh, all the best players uh-huh. still come from South Korea. But sure. that's not where they're most watched. The audience is now in the West. Holy shit. That's okay. How do I how do I get into StarCraft 2 for money? Is the question. <laughs> well that's it. Um, I'll tell you that that's impossible. Right? Um, as, as someone that sinks over ten thousand dollars a month into a StarCraft 2 team in South Korea, <laughs> trust me, there was no money to be had here. None. <laughs> <laughs> you should try a, you should try salty bet. Honestly, I, I have considered, well, I watch it, and I've considered commentating it for a laugh. I thought that would be pretty funny. <laughs> but it's like, well, I've got to learn this 2,000 character roster. Let's begin. <laughs> well, uh, I, think that's, I think that's my big problem, too, with, um, with like watching like fighting game tournaments and stuff. Because outside of very basic fighting game concepts, like professional fighting, I guess, yeah, I guess professional you'd call it, uh, fighting game tournaments, they get really fucking into it. Yep. And there's like a, like a whole new... Uh, not language, but there's a whole new set of terminology for things like that that you don't even. Wear. It's beyond like projectiles. It's like you're playing footsies. You're you got cross a meaty up. hit in there. Yep, P- yep cross ups, piano inputs, all that stuff. Yeah, you know? that's. I, I, I always found that really interesting because the fighting game scene and the way they present it is very different from the bigger the bigger esports around right now. Three big esports, mm-hmm. well, four big esports right now outside of fighting games. Right, there's LOL, there mm-hmm. is Dota two, there's Call of Duty. And they're StarCraft 2. Yeah? And they yeah, all do yeah. the commentary in about the same kind of way. And then there's the fighting game mm-hmm. guys that will play right. 12 different fighting games at the same tournament who <laughs> don't even necessarily have professional commentators. And the guys that they do have will use a bunch of terminology that is completely unusual and very difficult to get into. And we'll also have these long parts of the commentary where they won't even speak, which is completely <laughs> out of the ordinary for any other esports game. And it's strange how that developed in tandem with everything else. Well, it, I guess it's, uh, it, I think what's tricky, though, is, too, with esports, and is if you talk about getting people into it, when you talk about the fighting game part of it, there's a pretty high barrier for entry there. You know what I yeah. mean? Because it's not, you can't even really go, like, well, I've played Street Fighter. You know, maybe you can watch it casually, but if you hear people, like, rattling off, things like this, you know, you're going to be completely lost, you know? I find Marvel Marvel 3 to be the most impenetrable thing. Oh, I, yeah. I watch that, and I'm like, well, I'm, I know what's happening, but <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, you're not yeah. explaining it to me either, so <laughs> uh, you do have to have, I think, a certain level of knowledge to watch it at that point. I mean, I watched a bit of Evo. I watched Smash, even though I really don't play Smash. I was like, that was mm. kind of entertaining. Obviously, Smash is sure. a fairly simple game. And I watched the Street Fighter because I play enough Street Fighter to kind of get what they're doing. But the rest of it, <coughs> especially things like King of Fighters, would just it went way over my head. Right, yeah. Well, that's... Th- yeah. And especially even... Cause I even played Marvel, too. But yeah, 3... So no. I. I I watched it, and it's like, there'll be like a triple combo, it's like a 100% hit, and I'm like, I don't even understand how you were supposed to dodge that, and then, you know, well, the fight's over, and then I'm like, well, but everyone seems to be enjoying it, so I'm sure there's things going on above my head about it, but, you know, 
Like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what it is about Marvel in particular that's attractive for people to watch because you can get into those scenarios where it's just you can execute a combo that will keep somebody in the air for a massive amount of time. Yeah. You don't have that in Street Fighter, which is why I think right, right. I like watching Street Fighter better because of that. It's more of it's more about a it's a positional game, right? And you're seeing mm-hmm. little plays going on here and there. You don't see this gigantic play that completely wipes an entire character off the screen. Right, right, right. You know what? By the way, it bugs me. I love Street Fighter Three actually because I the parry system was so fun. Like as far as mind games go, yeah. I don't know if you ever played that at all. I, I did, but, um, and that's actually one of the most well-known esports moments of all time. Is the full parry? Of course. Yeah, I think everyone remembers yeah. that one. I I did play a little bit of it. It was on Dreamcast, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah I played a bit of it, but not much. I used to play it in the Port Authority, like at the arcade, just like to fuck around with people in New York City or whatever, mm-hmm. like because it was just a. A really fun thing to do, even if you didn't parry very well, but to, like, trick the other person. Like, one guy, like, uh, I jumped into him and I didn't do anything. And he, like, parried because he figured I was going to jump in with a kick or something. But then he did that and it opened him up and he sort of laughed when it happened. It was, like, this neat kind of thing going. But you, you've, you've found the essence of fighting games right there, that it's a gigantic mind game as much as it is finger dexterity. That's the thing. Well, that's the thing, but the problem, I guess, with it is then that, like, you had these people who could parry fucking anything, hence the Daigo video, yeah. you know. And then they kind of took it out in four, and they have, like, focus mode, where I think it's, like, you can parry, sort of parry through one move. Yeah, you, you kind of but, eat, you eat the hit, and yeah. it doesn't knock you in the air or put you in a position where you can be comboed, but you lose mm-hmm. the health, and it gradually comes back. So if it's you like, don't get hit again, you take no damage, but if you do, then that health is gone. Well, you sound like you could actually... You'd be a, an esports commentator for Street Fighter Four, then. So I don't know, but um, that's about yeah. as much. I mean, I I play, <laughs> I play Dan as my only character. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> what? Funnily enough, it's actually viable now. It didn't used to be back in it was Street Fighter Four. Dan sucked. Apparently, he's a lot better oh. now, which makes me feel bad because I used to like with when I was playing online with Dan. It was like, well, even if I lose, I kind of win because I was playing Dan. And if I win, <laughs> it's like a double yeah. win, right? Now that's well, not that's there the anymore. Ul- that's the ultimate mind yeah, game. That, that's but, wait a minute. You're you're telling me they balance Dan? Yeah, pretty much. Like, they they balance the, they balance pretty much everybody. Apparently, I blame that fucking Serlin guy. Oh uh, yes, I I think everyone's read that uh, particular <laughs> piece, which they should because it's a great piece. But I, it is actually he he comes off a little pretentious sometimes um, yeah. because I've read later stuff about how he was disappointed in Portal Two, which I'm like eh, I don't know, but I see his point where. There were, like, sections of the game that didn't feel like the rest. Mo- notably the um, the Cave Johnson section, mm-hmm. where there's certain areas there's very little to portal off of, and you're really just playing Where's Waldo to get from each segment to each segment. Yeah. I think Disappointed is still strong, mm-hmm. frankly. But it, it, And the problem is, I guess, too, when you yourself are a, a game designer and you talk about other people in your trade, it kind of can lead to an air of, well, I can do better than that. You know what I mean? Whereas if you're just a straight-up critic, that's kind of your job or whatever, you know? Yeah, and even if you are a straight-up critic, it can be very difficult to do that because you have those moments of self-realization, that Ratatouille moment where it's like, well, I'm shitting on your game, but you still created it, and I didn't. So, you know, the the <laughs> act of creation is better than anything I could ever do. But you still got to be careful because, you know, as a critic or whatever, the priority really is to the consumers, and it's to try and give them information to help them make good choices because they're not sitting in a position where they get all their games for free. And buying a game sure. for them could be the only piece of entertainment they get to buy in that particular <coughs> time because they just don't have any more money. So they better make a good call. Well, that's the a, that's a shitty thing, though, about uh, video game criticism, though, in general, is it, it for the li- almost the lifetime of the industry, really, it's had the most vociferous fan base. Mm, God. For, you know? Once people are into a video game, you can never say anything bad about it. It doesn't matter. It is the most yeah. insidious and horrible thing, I think, that we currently have within the industry. The idea that mm-hmm. somebody will get to the point where they will actively become the marketing arm of this company, and they paid them for the <laughs> privilege of doing it. Not only that, but they, they want to so justify the purchase in their head. The way that I think it works is, I can't make mm-hmm. a bad choice, yeah? So if right. I bought this game and I mm-hmm. kind of feel like I didn't like it, then one, I've got to establish a state of cognitive dissonance where I kind of do like it. And secondly, right. because I, I never made a bad choice, I have to defend this game from people that by proxy said that I did because they called it shit, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And exactly. it's horrible because they're consumers going out of their way to mislead other consumers and insult them for 
saying, you know what, this might not be worthy of my time or money. That's horrible. It's awful. Right. No, it's true. And it's everywhere, yeah. you know? And I can see it um, I can see it for the consoles because, you know, typically for most, house, for most households, you know, you, don't have you buy one consoles. console. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I can see that, like, I'm stuck with this for the next year or two, so, I, you know, I'm going to justify it to myself. Yeah, I, I see, picked the right console. And you see that, I found in America you'd see that, uh, or I'm sure Europe works the same way, like, you see that with cell phone contracts? Yeah. Where um, if somebody gets a cell phone, even if they don't particularly like it, they think they do because they're stuck with it for a while. Yeah, locked so, into you know. it for like two years. So you you made the best choice because obviously you're very tech savvy. You know what you're doing. You would never make a bad mm-hmm. choice, and you'd certainly no. you'd never be misled by a company into getting this phone. You're far too <laughs> smart for that. So absolutely, yeah. You just don't get it, man. But the but the I know I don't. But the <laughs> games. I mean, the games are like you know everybody buys a bad game. It yeah. happens, you know. Yeah. It, it had tits on the cover. I just tried it, you know, and it's like, but then people get invested in that, yeah. you know? It's like crazy. It's becoming worse as well because so many games have gone down the route of permanent progression and that persistent mm-hmm. aspect of it. We saw right. how it worked with WoW, right? Because you get so invested in WoW, that you've spent so much time in it that coming around and saying, I don't like this game anymore, or even admitting that there might be a better alternative is heresy. Mm-hmm. Because you, yeah. you sunk so much of your life into it, you can't possibly have made that bad decision. And to be you fair, know, that would fu- feel terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's how people buy into Scientology, if you want to the truth. Well, because, because, because they a- just they throw so much money at it that they get invested. And, yeah, yeah, I can, and time. I can see that, yeah. Yeah, apparently, like, the, the crazy stuff uh, comes in, like, the whole, like, aliens and Xenu thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, comes in after you spent, if I remember correctly, something on the order of it's six digits, like one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. You reach and some over, level, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It's OT three. It's like okay. three years or whatever. And you know, if you've spent that kind of time and money on anything, of course you want to justify it. You don't want to think I threw that away. So if somebody tells you something crazy like that, you're more apt to buy into it. You know? Yeah, it's so, pretty damn sinister, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, too, because, like, um, WoW, I think, stumbled upon it, but they have, like, a little psychological thing going where it's, like, a kind of... You know the Skinner box? The mouse taps a button and gets a pellet yeah. kind of thing? Mm-hmm. And they find, like, if the if the pellets drop randomly from the button, the mouse will just keep pressing it and getting more and more pellets. Yep. Like, they get more invested if they don't know when it's coming. And it seems like rare drops in, like, WoW and games like that, or in MMOs tend to keep people invested because they're not 100% sure if they'll get their reward. Yeah, I mean, you could you go even further things? back than that and just talk about Diablo, the original. Oh, it yeah. It has the same kind of thing going for it, and it's probably one of the reasons why people played Diablo and Diablo 2 for 10-plus years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm not saying that these games uh, designers did this on purpose to exploit people psychologically. No, they just kind of stumbled on it. Exactly, yeah. But then, and then you get the companies like Zynga and uh, things like that, you know. Who are yeah. thankfully losing a lot of money right now, and oh, deservedly so. Mm-hmm. I, it's the, I, I can't believe I, I recommend this as a humor piece, but I do love EA's uh, lawsuit to them. It was pretty about, good. Yeah, this, I would recommend any, every, anybody read that. It's not just legalese, there's great screenshots of the side-by-side. The first and only time in history where people actually supported EA versus somebody else. <laughs> I feel like it would be EA versus Stalin and people would back Stalin. <laughs> well, to be fair, I think Stalin would let you play the video game once or twice. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? Um, fortunately, my wife's signaling me that we've reached our hour and I have to make dinner. Come in, number 37, but, um, your time is up. I know, I have to, I have to, yeah. What can you do? It's It's hard, it's hard when you reach this age to even get to play these damn games anymore. But I do find the time to talk about them for an hour or whatever, so... Yeah, totally. And, of course, looping us back nicely to the start, that's why we like things like Brothers, because you can beat it in one sitting and have that satisfying experience and have no desire to think, you know what, I should really grind it for six to more hours to get the most out of it. You know, my favorite part about Brothers, or the thing I think it was missing, was some asshole yattering in my ear the entire time over all the emotional stuff. I I just can't imagine why you would miss out on that opportunity. I thank God for YouTube there. Yeah. Excellent job, gentlemen. Bringing out one thing the game missed, but, um... Phenomenal. Thank you for... Sorry. Thank you very much for uh, coming on and uh, bullshitting with me. Definitely. Awesome. Um, well, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk online or whatever, but, uh, see you at the next PAX. Yep. Or something. Run into you there, man. Have a good evening. You too.